button for this meeting. This will enable us to share the presentation with you and others who are interested in the topic after it's over. And now that we're just about ready to get started, Ike would like to say a few words regarding University House Wallingford and our speaker today. Thank you, Elliot. As an era living community in affiliation with the University of Washington Retirement Association, our residents benefit from the partnerships developed with the University of Washington Schools of Nursing, Social Work, and Pharmacy to deliver innovative programs designed with healthy living in mind. We are pleased today to have with us Dr. Nick Bond, who has joined us today to present on a timely topic, climate change and the Puget Sound's marine ecosystem. Dr. Nick Bond is a principal research scientist with the Cooperative Institute for Coastal, Ocean, and Ecosystem Studies of the University of Washington. He has a PhD in atmospheric sciences from the UW. His, his research focuses on the weather and climate of the Pacific Northwest and the linkages between the climate and marine ecosystems of the North Pacific. He is the climatologist for the state of Washington and in his own words, proud to, be, proud to be a weather geek. Please welcome Dr. Nick Bond to University House Wallingford. Thank you everybody. And I'm gonna take the opportunity to share my screen. And let's, what you should be seeing here is a, one of the best drawn marlin you'll ever see for our very own David Horsey. Um, editorial cartoonist who went along for a long time with the PI and now back with the Times. Can everybody see my screen and hear me fine? Hearing no objections. Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Bond. Yes. All right. Very good. Um, I, this, I like to start off with this cartoon on this uh, subject because like all good satire, it hits kind of uncomfortably close to home. To be sure, we're not expecting marlin in the next few decades in the Puget Sound, but um, the times are already changing, and what's going to happen to the sound is um, a, a subject of a lot of interest and importance, I would say. What we're going to, uh, oh, I need to get, what we're going to do today here is talk about climate change and what it's liable to do to the marine ecosystem in Puget Sound. I'm gonna, um, it's gonna be a whirlwind tour of um, uh, a marine heat wave that we had a few years ago and whether that, uh, how much we've learned from that, a little bit about what we've seen in the historical record, what are the projections are showing and I wanna, um, uh, finish off with uh, kind of some words of optimism, the actions that are being taken right now on behalf of Puget Sound that gives us reason to, um, you know, for hope. And all this is under kind of the lens of an, uh, the ecosystem implications, you know, from the, the biological side. Before we get started, I want to start with a little factoid that I think um, people will find fascinating, certainly I did. And that is basically important salmon in the Pacific Northwest was due to the economy in the late 1800s going into the early 1900s. Um, there were you know, tremendous runs in the Columbia River, but in the Puget Sound rivers too. And due to um, uh, increase uh, or improvements in the technology of canning, that resource was exported uh, to the Eastern US and all the way to Europe. And there were boom times. A supervisor on a canning line could make $500 a month in the late 1800s. Unskilled Chinese immigrants provided room and board could make $200 a month, which was maybe 20 times what they could make in China. To be sure there was plenty of discrimination and mistreatment and so forth, but there were boom times. And in fact, a historian uh, and also a publisher of a small newspaper in Southwest Washington has some pretty persuasive evidence that the little town of Chinook, Washington, near the mouth of the, the Columbia on the Washington side, um, had the highest average income of any municipality in the entire US for a number of years there in the late 1800s, basically because of salmon. The fishers did great. 
you know, the runs were going great and, you know, they didn't last forever and all that, but salmon was, um, was a big deal. All right. But uh, let's, uh, you know, let's talk about the issue at hand here. Here's just a map of the um, Puget Sound and uh, part of the Strait of Georgia, what's commonly re now referred to as the Salish Sea. Um, it's kind of tilted on its side, so you're going to have to tilt your head to look at it in a familiar way. The darker the blue, the deeper the water. And one thing that's kind of interesting about um, uh, Puget Sound, the Salish Sea, is that it is relatively fertile, uh, productive compared to most fjords. In fact, there's a book entitled The Fertile Fjord. And in part, that is because of uh, this bathymetry and um, the, what it means when the, uh, with the tides and so forth, there's a greater mixing of water from below with nutrients up uh, to, to near the surface that kind of can fuel the whole uh, food, uh, food chain. And so compared to most fjords around the world, uh, the Puget Sound is actually very productive. And so just to kind of start off, and I'm going to have a pose a few questions in here um, as we go, just to get audience participation. Um, I would like to get uh, some people's uh, thoughts about what we might be looking at in this photograph right here. And you see this white patch in the water. It's near um, Point Roberts, you know, right near the Canadian border. Um, does anybody have a, and guesses are just fine. What is this white patch with the hint it is a good thing? And you can submit uh, your answer to chat, or if Elliot can unmute you, you can just shout out an answer either way. But anybody got a guess? And Dr. Bond, we've got one guess, eggs of a marine creature. Oh, you're muted, Dr. Bond. Let me unmute you here. Uh, um, uh, so I'm unmuted now, right? You can hear me, right? Yes, you're unmuted. Yeah, so that was an excellent, um, maybe more than a guess. Yeah, this is herring spawn. And it turns out that herring are a very important forage fish you know, for uh, harbor porpoises, salmon, and so forth. And that this uh, concentrated spawn from the herring, you can see the seabirds are, are liking it too, is... Um, important because in some of the herring stocks in Puget Sound going back um, decades are definitely on the decline. And so the idea that maybe in at least in some places the herring are coming back is a good sign. And so again, uh, tip of the hat to the person who got that answer right. All right. Um, as uh, you know, promised or threatened, depending on your point of view, I want to kind of look back at the uh, the marine heat wave, otherwise known as the um, the blob that occurred a few years ago, because it was kind of a wake up call for the climate community. It turns out uh, why it was such a big deal is if you look at water temperatures off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, and we have decent estimates actually going back to the 1890s, there's um, year to year variations in kind of warm periods and cold periods. And then in just the last few years, 2014 to 2016, there was this um, huge spike in temperatures off our coast, unprecedented, and it had you know, all sorts of um, implications for the marine ecosystem, both um, in the open ocean and here in the sound. And speaking of the sound, a time series not going back nearly as far, but um, uh, some work that was put together by um, the uh, Department of uh, combination Department of Ecology in King County, just showing uh, this top trace here shows kind of overall heat content in, in Puget Sound uh, from 2007 through 2019. These red bars show the years 
of the blob where it was a lot more heat in the Puget Sound than usual. The, this middle bar chart shows salinity for what it's worth and it was kind of a lot of fresh water there. And then importantly, this bottom chart shows dissolved oxygen concentrations in the sound with this uh, period of warmer water. Uh, uh, the, the red bars show deficits in oxygen content that uh, can be a big deal for the marine ecosystem of uh, some species. And so associated with that are some, um, some very notable fish kills in Hood Canal, for example. There's a red rock crab, an English sole. I'm not sure what those guys are, maybe sand lance or an eel pout or something. But there were some big fish kills uh, noted when the waters were really warm in Puget Sound and in many places low in dissolved oxygen. Just another way to kind of look at that is for a particular place in the southern part of Hood Canal, where we have time series from a mooring uh, in 2010 through 2015 shown here, that shows how the oxygen varies with depth, where this zero means, um, well, meters from the surface. And so the, the top part is right near the, air sea interface and you're going down to 30 meters. Redder colors in this uh, chart show more oxygenated water. The blue color, low oxygen contents. And in um, Hood Canal, there's some kind of an ongoing problem with periods of low oxygen concentrations. But here in 2015, it, especially in the uh, lower part of the water column, it really started early in the summer and got really bad where the concentrations were getting, well, uh, to the uh, uh, point where certain species were suffocating. And uh, we were really bailed out. There was a very strong storm that came through in the late August of 2015 that kind of stirred up that water column and kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of reduce that effect. And if we hadn't had that storm, I don't know what would have happened. But again, this was um, some serious things that were associated with the blob in Puget Sound. And it wasn't just in marine waters, but in the freshwater habitat. I think uh, when I gave the talk at um, University House uh, last fall, uh, I may have had the same figure, and so you're getting it again. But anyway, this is an example of the stream flow in the Nooksack River, South Fork for what it's worth, uh, from January through September of 2015. This blue trace shows how much water was coming down the, the hill um, day by day. Um, and the gold triangles show what the average is for that time of year. And uh, during the, um, that winter, it was really warm. There was plenty of rain, but not much snow. And so we had some floods on a lot of the rivers in Western Washington, but uh, very little snowpack. And so the flow in the many rivers went uh, you know, into the toilet. There's a less polite way to put that, but uh, it declined much earlier in the summer than it usually uh, does. And that kind of low flow meant much warmer temperatures in the streams are early in the summer than usual with the, the gold triangle showing, you know, temperature over the course, of, average temperature over the course of the summer. And here, you know, this blue trace, what actually happened in 2015. And the consequence was, um, some uh, massive die-offs of the adult salmon that were trying to get back to their hatcheries and to their um, natural spawning grounds. And so this is just happens to be a tributary of the Columbia in the Gorge, the White Salmon River. There were other places this happened. The biggest contribution to freshwater in the sound, the Fraser River had the same sort of thing where it had big flows in the winter time I have shown this green trace and kind of early in the summer, but because of lack of snowpack in its watershed, uh, compared to the usual, the blue trace, again, the flows went down um, 
Uh, they always decline in summer, but they decline sooner. And the consequence, again, was um, all kinds of uh, implications for the salmon returning. And here's just an example of some fish that would die before they could actually get into the hatchery there on the Wallace River in Idaho. All right. So the blob was kind of, um, you know, maybe a dress rehearsal wake up call about the sort of things that uh, we might anticipate with climate change. Um, uh, despite what, um, you know, what people are saying, it really is a, a real thing. We don't know exactly how it's going to play out, just maybe how fast it's going to happen, but it's already happening to an extent, and we know it's going to uh, accelerate. And so the question is, you know, what can we do about it? So, um, as kind of, um, you know, some background material, for, you know, with regards to climate change, one thing that isn't uh, commonly appreciated is just how much of the extra heat in the climate system is being soaked up by the ocean. And there, we have uh, very reliable measurements of this that in the last few decades, that over 90% of the extra heat and about a third of the um, additional carbon is going into the ocean and people are arguing about you know the atmosphere whether the warming is the same as what the models are showing or what but that's a very small um, amount of the extra heat content in the system and so we know that the whole climate system is warming up and we know there's going to be um, continue that's going to continue and there's going to be implications from it uh, some of those implications were summarized in this report that's online from the Intergovernment um, Panel on Climate Change. This report weighs in at about 1,200, 1,300 pages. It's available online. Feel free to, easy to find. You can download it and read it for yourself, knock yourself out. Um, I'm just going to have a couple of tidbits from it, um, but um, the, the message I want to get across is we're trying to, you know, there's some serious work trying to figure out, you know, how the ocean and the cryosphere, the glaciers and ice packs and uh, so forth are changing and uh, that's going to do to things like uh, the marine ecosystem. And one thing to keep in mind is that um, it's not all doom and gloom. And that the idea, you know, the sun's going to come up, there's going to be nutrients in the ocean, phytoplankton are going to grow, zooplankton are going to eat them, there's going to be a food chain. It's going to be different, but it's not like the, um, the world's oceans are all going to go into, you know, um, become the Dead Sea or anything. They're going to be different places, and we got to manage them uh, responsibly. But um, you know, it's it's not like um, yeah, as bad as it might appear. All right, and as another point here to make, uh, kind of bring home the idea that you know there's room for optimism or reason to hope. Here I have a plot. Um, going back to the late 1930s when Bonneville Dam was installed with a fish ladder where they could count returning salmon. This shows uh, through 2019 how many, the numbers of returning adult salmon were counted at Bonneville Dam. And to be sure, these numbers here early in the record in the 40s through 80s or so forth, uh, between a quarter million and a half a million fish returning each year is far, is a lot smaller than the historical runs in, in the 1800s. Um, we have, you know, estimates maybe uh, 10, 20 times that. But uh, the, the main point on this graph here is note here for, since 2000, actually the returns have been quite a bit higher than they were in past decades. And so this is, uh, this is, again, maybe not common knowledge. Now, not all stocks are in great shape. It's mostly the fall runs, not the spring runs. But again, it's not like um, all the runs are going extinct. 
And that brings up my next question here. And so Elliot has to work his magic here to um, either unmute people or, you know, people can submit um, their answers to uh, via chat. What do you think is responsible for these large increases in returns? Here again, this is on the Columbia River of adult Chinook starting around 2000. What, uh, and of course we want to know what's going to happen into the future, but, and the last couple of years it haven't been so great, but what, what can we attribute this um, huge increase in returns? So you, your turn, what do you think? Don't be bashful. We have uh, one guess, fishing regulations. Ah, uh -huh. that's, um, yeah, that's part of it. Yeah, there's a, a, a much, um, you know, depending on your point of view, you know, kind of uh, more restrictions on both sport fishery and commercial fishing and so forth. I don't think that it, that's a, certainly a factor. I'm not sure if it's the leading factor. And so anybody else? We have another guest that says dam removal. Ah, uh, that, that's close enough that I got to give credit and, you know, get that guy a cigar or something or gal a cigar. Yeah, yeah it's actually um, practices, you know, freshwater practices in there and passages. Um, um, you know, at that point, we weren't. I hadn't removed that many dams, but uh, improving fish passages, um, both to get the juveniles down to the ocean in good shape and um, allow the adult salmon to get back to their hatcheries and spawning grounds and that sort of thing. That's a lot of it here. A lot of it also has to do with um, better ocean conditions for the fish when they went to sea as youngsters. And so, um, again, you know, the main point here is, boy, you know, compared to many decades of these kinds of returns, we did have some very good runs um, in, um, in recent years. Now, uh, I should say 2015, there were a lot of fish that got to Bonneville Dam that weren't able to get to their spawning grounds, again, because their, the water was so warm, but at least there were a lot of adults returning. All right, thanks for your responses. Now, uh, when we talk about the changes you know, with climate change, it's not just temperatures that are changing. Uh, I don't wanna go through all the details of this um, conceptual model here, but the chemistry is changing. There's going to be, um, you know, obviously what the atmosphere is doing, the storm is perhaps um, rises in sea level. Um, and so it, it's a very kind of complicated system and um, we're still not sure how it's all gonna play out, but we're doing our best to try to figure this out again so we can manage it you know, more responsibly. And speaking of you know, some of the, um, the kind of interactions between different parts of the system, I know this slide breaks all the rules for presentation in terms of you have know, far too much stuff on it. Um, but just the idea that um, what we're trying to do here, and this is an example for uh, the region of the San Juan Islands, is trying to look at from the top, um, you know, it's for various years, what the climate forcing was doing, what the kind of local conditions were like in the middle, what was happening at the base of the food chain and at higher trophic levels, and just trying to figure out how these different parts of the system connect. And so we're um, uh, here, you will not be tested on, you know, the results here, but just uh, one thing to, um, additional point to make here is that we've had definitely in the 2014, 16 and kind of lingering, we've had this kind of warm era. And then there were some years right before it, it was on the cool side. And then before that, a kind of a more mixed bag. And so by having this kind of, variability in what the um, conditions were like, we're able to kind of learn about how the, the system works. 
and I uh, just skip this, but uh, the main point here is that, yeah, that was for the San Juans. This is for Point Jefferson, uh, Kitsap County, and that one size doesn't fit all. And in some places, what, um, uh, where it might have been during the blob years, you know, kind of um, lower productivity, that wasn't necessarily the case everywhere. And so, again, just the uh, point of making it's uh, one size doesn't fit all. Speaking of, of um, phytoplankton and the base of the food chain, one thing that we've been seeing recently that happened to an extent before, but I, I my understanding is to a, in a bigger way than um, than we've seen for a while is um, just some of the species of the the phytoplankton that are uh, you know kind of. Uh, growing and prospering in Puget Sound. This is um, in Hood Canal and this uh, kind of milky green water is from um, uh, coca lithophores. Um, they tend to do well when uh, in kind of low nutrient levels and they can sometimes have a really big impact on the food web in that seabirds have a hard time finding their prey in this. Sometimes it um, marine mammals also struggle finding fish because the water is just not clear enough. Uh, some zooplankton don't like to eat them so much. And so um, this is something that, if not alarming, it's just kind of interesting that we had such a massive uh, coccolithophore bloom in our waters recently. One thing that's definitely happened around here is that sea level is rising. We have a tide gauge in Elliott Bay that um, had uh, good measurements of that back you know, over a century. And uh, uh, different places have different um, uh, rates of sea level rise just because of um, the geology of the region and the kind of recovery from the last ice age. But much of the Puget Sound area is um, the sea level is rising and there are implications of that. The other thing, um, what the climate models are showing, um, um, you know, getting back to the, the basics here, is that it is, um, we're liable to see warming, um, both, in, uh, you know, especially in the North Pacific, this particular a uh, map shows how much warmer in degrees Celsius uh, the models as a group are suggesting kind of under a worst case scenario um, in the kind of the first part of this century, 2006 to 2055, um, averaged over those years versus the latter half of the 20th century. And you can see uh, definitely uh, warming, especially in the higher latitudes of the North Pacific. What may be more relevant to our backyard is just what's, well, what's happening around here. And uh, what I was able to dig up here was more just looking at the end of this century, um, uh, the, uh, the warming that's expected, that the models are predicting. Um, uh, compared to kind of the, the start of this century. And here, the redder the color, the more the warming, uh, the yellow ones less so. And what you can see here is, and there's some uh, general acceptance of this, is greater warming in the, uh, and these are surface temperatures right along the coast than in Puget Sound proper itself. And that's in part because the water that's coming into Puget Sound, a lot of this, I think, is comes in at depth where there's going to be a slower rate of warming. And so that's kind of good news in that we're not going to be seeing the same rates of warming, probably, that uh, in the open ocean. But there, there again, if you really drill down and look in here into, you know, some of the bays here in this, uh, Snohomish River Delta, then there's going to be kind of enhanced um, warming when you get right near the beach compared to the more kind of uh, open waters of Puget Sound. And this could have implications for juvenile salmon, uh, among other species. 
The other thing we're expecting with warmer air temperatures is uh, more rain and less snow in the winter time. And so the, uh, the idea there is that, um, and maybe uh, probably wetter winters, and so kind of more floods, more water coming down the mountains in the winter time, less snowpack and less water available to uh, coming uh, uh, down the streams to get us through the dry season of you know, late spring through early fall. What these charts show, you know, are changes here. Um, the 2050s, this middle row, 2080s, the bottom row. It kind of depends what the world does as a whole in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, fossil fuel combustion, and so forth, with this high or 8.5 scenario being kind of a worst case sort of thing. But the, the, the idea is that if we continue along the path we're on, that the, there's going to be, uh, especially toward the end of the century, considerably more runoff in winter than we're kind of used to and that the fish are adapted to, and a lot less runoff in the summertime when stream flows are already uh, kind of on the low side. And uh, what that means is, um, yeah, a different kind of seasonality in the flow on our rivers. Uh, the Samish River that is up in northwest Washington, uh, very low elevation watershed, gets uh, mostly, almost exclusively rain right now. With climate change, we think, and maybe a little bit wetter in winter, and so its seasonality of its flow isn't going to be too much different. So maybe a fish, if it can handle a little bit warmer temperatures, won't be too upset by, um, you know, the changes in the Samish, but the Snohomish River, which now gets both snow in and rain in the winter and so has some floods, but also has a, a lot of snow melt to um, have a second peak in its flow uh, with that snow melt in late spring, early summer. It's going to go to a rain dominant sort of system and the Sauk River that now is snow dominant doesn't have too much in the way of floods and gets its main flows with the spring melt is going to go to this kind of double uh, one-two punch sort of system. And so the stocks that are uh, adapted to this kind of seasonality in the flow, you know, in terms of their freshwater habitat that are changing are the ones that, you know, there's some concern about. The other thing is, um, again, just to, you know, kind of beating a dead horse is uh, yeah, yeah, stream flows down in the summertime, that that means lower flow means warmer water. And our anticipation is that more and more of the, the streams around Puget Sound, especially as we get later into the uh, this century, we'll have summer stream temperatures that are getting into the levels here that trout and salmon are not really very happy about. And in some cases, um, they can even get to the, uh, you know, above 20, that fatal for some species and so forth. And so an increasingly um, fraction of the habitat is getting to be unsuitable for, uh, for salmon. Um, the other chance there is as, you know, temperatures are going up and things are changing is that of some real surprises there that um, we're going to get just kind of like the blob was a big surprise that we're going to get new combinations of both the climate and other parts of the system and just the uh, marine ecosystem will be pushed into a state that hasn't been pushed in before and that um, whole community reorganizations. And um, this is something that we don't have a great handle on, but just still the possibility there of some nasty surprises is, is definitely out there. All right, another question for you guys. Um, here, uh, you know, I've talked about the marine heat wave, the blob, and of course we have all for, you know, always had uh, heat waves on land, right? 
land-based one. Uh, last week, we got to 94 at SeaTac, and it was pretty hot here for a couple of days. So the question to you guys, do you think there's going to be, um, just based on what our models are showing and kind of thinking about the how this system uh, works, do you think there's going to be a uh, greater increase in the frequency of the land-based or marine heat waves? And here, you know, it's kind of, you got one, uh, you can pick one or the other. So it's an easy, easy question, right? And hopefully we'll get <laughs> answers from both parties. Anybody? Anybody that think it's going to be land-based? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Got some of them. Yes, as well. Okay. We got both. Well, good. Because um, what it actually looks like, and this is kind of a complicated graph, but um, yeah, certainly we're going to have more land-based heat waves. But um, even though there might be warming, uh, more kind of warming of the air temperatures in the next few decades than in the water temperatures, we already have so much variability in the system that there's not going to, when you look at the tail of the distribution here, um, we're maybe going to have double the amount of um, uh, heat waves when you talk about the top 1% of the hottest days or something, there's going to be, they're going to be occurring twice as often. But because the marine system, there's a lot of thermal inertia there, and not as much variability, a smaller shift in the ocean actually means a lot more marine heat waves when you talk about from the point of view of getting into that um, the very upper 1% of the, the warmest temperatures. And so it's kind of a weird way about a thinking of it, but um, for the marine ecosystem that is adapted to a very narrow range of temperatures, in a way they, uh, they're gonna have to adjust maybe faster than creatures on land like us. Um, you know, getting right back to the kind of Puget Sound in particular, we know that you know, for, um, based on historical records for the, um, this stock of uh, Chinook salmon in uh, Puget Sound, there is a relationship with temperatures where Warmer temperatures, they tend not to do as well. Not as many adults from return. But, you know, it's a kind of a shotgun blast here. There's not that much um, of the variability that's explained just by temperature. Um, so it's not like we're exactly sure what's going to happen. Um, I want to get back to uh, a point that I raised before, and that's, you know, the temperature isn't the only thing changing. pH is definitely, our models are showing, that's going down. The oceans are acidifying. They're absorbing ca carbon. That science is absolutely certain that that's happening. Exactly how fast it's going to happen is one thing. The other thing that it looks like is that in a lot of the world's oceans, the um, uh, oxygen constants, concentrations are going down. And so how is that going to play out in um, Puget Sound? Well, we know that there are some, um, uh, some of the marine ecosystems, some of the species that um, have to build shells with a lower pH, uh, uh, the ocean acidification, their shells, there's an energetic, energetic cost to building those shells, and there's even in some cases kind of dissolving of them. And so some, uh, some real implications of the changes of the chemistry there. And this is based on some uh, very solid laboratory studies and so forth. Taking that another step, um, there's um, some folks have tried to look at the, the, the circled elements here, elements of the food web that are directly uh, uh, impacted by the pH of the ocean and how that's going to link to other parts of the food web that both eat them or, or are eaten by them. 
you know, I keep saying how complicated the system it is to try to account for all these interactions, you know, I think you can kind of appreciate that. Some of the results are that, and I'm actually a little bit heartened by this, is that for some species, just um, uh, perhaps it's, um, the acidification is gonna, is a negative impact, but it's not like it's gonna necessarily devastate just from that alone. And from, uh, for what it's worth is in many cases, there are some winners along with losers and maybe the flat fish will kind of be able to prosper at the expense of some of these other species. Crab, definitely, they're not, they're not looking too happy as the uh, due to ocean acidification in the sound. Harmful algal blooms. You probably, you guys have probably heard about some of the um, big ones we've had in recent years. And with the warmer temperatures in the sound, we're anticipating just a longer window in which those blooms um, can occur. Just the warmer temperatures for a lot of the well, they, in this case, is this is Alexandrium that causes the paralytic shellfish poisoning. And a real problem in Puget Sound waters that just that window will be that much longer for this um, this organism to thrive in Puget Sound waters, and so um, that threat will be that much increased. Uh, another thing. Um, uh, getting back to a point I made before, sea level is rising, going to continue to rise. There's no stopping it. And what that's going to do to the estuaries um, around the deltas around Puget Sound. And um, here there's, uh, I don't, by no means an expert on this, but uh, uh, for uh, salmon, for example, uh, take advantage of different parts, uh, different kinds of habitats, different parts of their life cycle as they're going from the freshwater to the saltwater habitat. And what we're anticipating with the sea level rise is changes in the um, in that from you know places that are maybe brackish going to more saltwater marshes other places, freshwater marshes, less of those in some cases. And uh, again, a pretty, um, there's a lot going on here, but um, the idea that these kind of key regions, rearing areas for the juvenile salmon in particular, that there are going to be some changes with um, sea level rise and climate change. In terms of what is, um, I want to get into a little bit about now and just to finish up the actions being taken on behalf of Puget Sound and I kind of end up on a, hopefully on a positive note. There's an entity called the Puget Sound Partnership that is a state agency. It's not regulatory, but it's, it's kind of an advisory in terms of leading the effort to restore the and protect Puget Sound. And one of the things that I think is really important about what they're doing here is making the connection between human well being and ecosystem health. And that the idea that people benefit from being outdoors and so forth, the, the whole forest bathing sort of thing, but, or, you know, just going, going for a little walk along the beach. And the healthier the Puget Sound is, the more li uh, liable they are to do that. And so there are some direct benefits to humans, um, obviously, um, and, there, and there's been some, some work showing that money going into restoration of Puget Sound actually has payoffs in terms of making property along the Sound that much more valuable and so forth. And so, um, you know, the, uh, some work is being done on that behalf. There's a long ways to go. This uh, chart here shows, especially for the Chinook salmon that the orcas, you know, want to eat here, that these darker red colors show where the, the runs are definitely on the very low side. Only the lighter pinks are a little better. And, you know, there's one example here that's the runs are in kind of decent shape. And so we've got a long ways to go, but um, we are working on it. And one of the things seems kind of 
uh, simple, but it's just f fixing our culverts. It's not a cheap thing, but there's court order to do this. And uh, that work, not going as fast as a lot of us would like, but is, uh, is proceeding and will have considerable payoffs to allow the adults to get back to their spawning beds and allow the juveniles to get to see in, in, in good shape. And so this is, um, this is something that's happening. Somebody mentioned um, earlier a, a dam removal. A real success story has, is the removal of the, uh, the dams on the Elwha. We just had um, uh, the Nooksack is, um, and the Pilchuck. They're, they're coming down now. And so this is dams that have outlived their functional purpose. We're starting to uh, kick them down, and um, it's a real success story, especially in El Wa, where salmon are starting to recolonize that um, pristine habitat that was above uh, the, the dams. I got to give a lot of credit to um, the tribes and what they're doing in terms of um, trying to improve the, uh, the ecosystem of Puget Sound. Um, uh, there's uh, the Swinomish is one of the leading ones there. They have this um, climate change report where they're uh, trying to figure out what's happening, where the bang for the buck can be. A lot of them are working on how can we return our streams to more natural conditions rather than just engineered channels to something that's more favorable for the for marine life, um, including but not just salmon. And I'm going to skip this one out of the interest of time. And uh, yeah, there's some real examples here of um, successful restoration projects. Anybody, where do you think this picture was taken? Skip the Nisqually Delta. Oh, bingo. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's, um, and um, there, uh, what has, you know, what might be considered strange bedfellows work together. Um, to um, uh, kind of uh, return a lot of that habitat to a more natural state and, um, um, you know, with payoffs for everybody from uh, folks who just like to visit that um, wildlife refuge to the actual, you know, marine species and seabirds and so forth. One, another reason for hope is, uh, um, some work that's been done a while ago about eelgrass. It turns out that's a really good ha habitat for a lot of species, you know, smaller fish and um, invertebrates and that sort of thing. And it turns out it actually grows a little bit faster in warmer water. And some folks have figured out where, um, you know, restoration projects would have, um, you know, where there's the greater potential and it's not like, um, you know, these have necessarily been implemented, but there's a, a lot of the region here where um, if we had, you know, the, the resources to, and the will to do it, we could, um, we could do a lot to um, improve the habitat. And uh, so warmer water isn't all bad. And then I also, uh, getting near the end here, want to give a shout out uh, to some of the municipalities and one that uh, with the Puget Sound Partnership is kind of a shining example is the city of Shoreline. It's uh, Mayor Will Hall there holding that salmon has been just a kind of a leader in trying to do um, what, um, you know, immune, uh, do the right thing in terms of um, in taking into account climate change and the actions on the local scale that can be done um, uh, with that in mind. And so there's, um, there is appetite for doing the things that we need to have done. And uh, here, I don't know if any of the, in the audience is from Shoreline, but um, you know, my hat's off to Will Hall and company. So just to summarize, uh, we had, you know, the blob a few years ago that was kind of a wake-up call for the climate community. And we are learning about how the system works from what, what happened during that. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can use that, uh, that information kind of helping manage and restore that system. 
And um, I know there's a lot of pressing issues, um, both on a national and the kind of regional level and that sort of thing. I would argue that we actually have some of the resources to, if not bring Puget Sound back to the condition it was in 1850 or something, to help maintain its viability. And um, there, um, you know, you've kind of tuned into this talk, and I imagine that I'll have a sympathetic audience here, but um, there are actions being taken on behalf, and there's, that's going to be continuing, and so I'm uh, looking forward to doing a the little bit that I can do to kind of help um, uh, promote that and, um, you know, keep this place uh, uh, as um, beautiful and healthy as we can. And so with that, I um, appreciate your attention and let's open it up for questions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Bond. We really appreciate your time today and the truly veritable wealth of information that you've shared with us. Uh, we did have one question that came in a little bit earlier. It was while you were talking about uh, whether it would be more likely to have marine or land heat waves. And the, the, the person asked, would marine heat waves or higher marine temperatures have an effect on hurricanes at all? Uh, yeah, good question. And um, the uh, what uh, it seems to be the case, both in the historical record and what our climate models are showing with all their warts and the imperfections and so forth, is that the hurricanes, yeah, um, uh, they need warm water and there won't necessarily be more hurricanes or tropical cyclones, but the very strongest ones will be that much stronger. And that there's kind of, um, yeah, the very uh, strongest ones are in the Western North Pacific where the water is especially warm. And we've, um, we know that, that how warm the ocean is kind of gives an upper limit to how strong the storm can be. So it's, uh, it's not so much how many but the, the, with warmer water, the very strongest ones will be that much more intense and obviously, you know, that much bigger a deal depending where they go. And remember, if you do have questions, you can ask them in the chat. Uh, we have another one that just came in. It says, given the expected increased summer upstream temperatures, how much impact on salmon survival can downstream habitat restoration and dam removal have? Yeah, very good. Um, yeah, and so where's my temperature one? There we go. Yeah, and so um, I, there it's kind of a mixed message. And, um, you know, dam removal in some cases um, uh, can help. In other cases, it can actually, and in 2015, we saw an example of that in the kind of upper watershed of the Yakima, is that some of the impoundments allowed water to be released um, when it was especially beneficial in the middle of summer that wouldn't have been there without that impoundment. And, um, but I, in other cases, um, that uh, allowing that water to kind of get warmed up behind the dam, um, especially um, if it's a kind of shallow reservoir, that leads to um, increased uh, stream temperatures. And so there, um, it, uh, again, it kind of depends on the, on the system and um, I think a lot of what we, uh, what we really need to do is to try to return streams to their more kind of natural conditions, plant trees along them to pr provide shade, uh, put in, uh, allow logs to be in there to create um, pools, uh, kind of cool water sanctuaries that on the, you know, the very hottest times of day that uh, the fish can kind of hide out there uh, when the water is that much warmer. And, um, uh, so that's kind of a vague answer, but that's, uh, again, because it uh, kind of depends on what stream you're, you're talking about, you know, what practices would really make the most sense. Well, we'll give it another few seconds to see if any more questions come in.
I I'd like to say what just well. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Dr. Oh, I was just going to say that, um, you know, as Elliot mentioned, I am your state climatologist. It's pretty easy to find the Office of the Washington State Climatologist online if, you know, follow up questions, um, if they're legit, right, <laughs> or even requests for data or something like that. Feel free to contact me and um, or the office and we'll see what we can do about, um, you know, uh, helping you out. And so if, if something... Um, you know, curse you down the line, you know, I'm here to serve the public as well as you know, state agencies and whoever. And so don't be bashful. Thank you, Dr. Bond. I think then we'll go ahead. Oh, we had one more question come in, if you have a moment. Sure. Uh, it says, will the figures from this talk be made available? And yes, we will be sharing uh, Dr. Bond's slideshow as well as a recording of the webinar. And we'll share Dr. Bond's uh, email address with you as well. So if you have any questions that you didn't feel comfortable asking or if any come up afterwards, please feel free to email them to Dr. Bond or to us and we can forward them on to you. Yeah. Uh, and and, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, and I was just gonna say concerning the slides that, you know, I don't always do a um, great job in terms of the attribution and so forth. And so if um, I, I'd certainly be able to help you out if in case that that was a, um, an issue too. And so here, um, yeah, small point, but anyway, thanks. Yep, thank you, Dr. Brown, we appreciate that. Uh, so, and we'll also send out a, a survey uh, when we send out the link to the webinar and the presentation slides will include a survey asking you about your experience on the Zoom call today. We would appreciate if you would fill that out. We'd love to hear any suggestions that you have, uh, ways that we can improve this uh, moving forward. We're always looking for ways to improve at University House. Thank you, Dr. Bond. And um, I just want to express our uh, sincere appreciation for you speaking today on this very important topic and, and for all you do on this topic and the dedication that you have for not only people of the state of Washington, but really for all over the world. And on behalf of University House Wallingford, uh, we thank you for joining us today. And I would like to wish everyone a good day and uni at University House Wallingford, where life goes on and lifelong learning thrives. Thank you all. Yeah, Take thank you. Everyone. Stay healthy yeah, and have a great day. And appreciate it.